We have layers and layers of time that come into play in this moment. Ben Wilson is here in 2019, having read words written about 1900 years ago by Luke, and Luke was writing about what happened with Jesus about 60 years before that. And Jesus is reading the ancient Hebrew scriptures, which were written about 700 years earlier than Jesus' time by Isaiah, who was, you following me, referring to the events of the Exodus, which happened about 200 years before Isaiah, 2,000 years before Isaiah, excuse me. The word that is spoken across the arc of history, bringing us from God's liberation of the Jews from Egypt some 3,000 years before the Common Era to where we are now, 2019, considering what God's liberation looks like in this year of our Lord to us and to those around us. The whole notion of, of existence being linear, time being a linear thing, is that there is a past, a present, and a future is a way of human conceiving of the world of existence that, that comes specifically to us from the Jews, believe it or not. History, the notion of history is specifically a Jewish notion. The Jewish people brought that into human consciousness. Without the Jews, we would be thinking about life and time in circles, in cycles, as many people of the East still do. But the Hebrew people influencing the West gave us a sense of the movement through time and opened the door to our working for progress and development through the arc of the years. It's central to our Judeo-Christian theology because the church says that history is ultimately going somewhere, which is towards fulfillment and completion. Whatever the present moment might suggest otherwise. History for, for the church, though, isn't understood as the story of superpowers of the world. It's not written as, as which superpower takes control, which lands have been conquered, the rise and fall of empires, but rather the story of, of, of the church, of, of Christianity in history is, is how God has been working in relationship with humanity to complete or save us. The church's word for it is salvation history. So the Christian assumption is that history is a process that we and the world have been undergoing towards salvation, a process of world creation and world becoming that God is unfolding around us, that God is unfolding with us. The scriptures name this, this process of becoming in a very particular way. And we hear it in what Ben read, of what Luke wrote, of what Jesus reads, of what the Isaiah, uh, prophet Isaiah said in referring to the Exodus story of the Hebrew people. And this, is the, this process of becoming, of salvation, is the process of the human being moving from enslavement to freedom, from oppression to blessing, from being bound to being unloosed from being blind to be receiving sight. That's what God in our lives looks like, whether individually or corporately, nationally, globally. And the two archetypal stories are the freedom of the enslaved Jews that, the, that our Jewish, um, Jewish friends, you know, constantly retell 
across the course of their year, remind themselves of, and then the archetypal story of the crucified and entombed Jesus being resurrected, which is our story that we tell throughout the year. So as we look at history, we are to see it as a process of unfolding like this, of being released and freed and awakened. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. All our individual and corporate awakenings and moments of discovery and reform and course correction seen together from a bird's eye view or God's eye view of our Christian faith affirms that we are in process together. We are in process of being saved, of being completed, of being renewed. As, as the theologian James Allison names it, we are undergoing God. We are undergoing God in this way. So it all started with a little ragtag band of nomads in the Middle East through whom the divine source of all that is sought to reveal herself and her purposes to the world. And it was a process of revelation, this revealing. Because one can only imagine if all truth, all light, all love was revealed to us in one fell swoop you know, would not be able to handle it. Poof, we'd be a little pile of ash. It would be so remarkable and amazing. <laughs> right? So glorious and mind-blowing would it be. So we can't just merge with God, period. We have to grow into God. Could God not just reveal everything, all truth and purpose and light, to the Hebrews in one fell swoop? without obliterating their freedom? No. So there was a point in time, a beginning, when God began unveiling God's self, God's purposes in the life of a, hum of a single human being named Abraham, right? The father of three faiths. And it was his descendants through whom God would begin to unveil the truth of human history, the light, the love that is the source and destination of it all. And so they got it, and they lost it. They were freed, and they were enslaved. They found their way to the divine, and they lost their way to the divine. That's what the Bible story is about. They heard uh, that God was one as opposed to many gods, and they were to be no other gods worshipped, and they honored that for a time, but they liked having something they could touch and see, and, and in many ways the, the, the pagan explanation for the many gods made more sense to them, and so they turned and away from God. They taught that this one God was defined by love and justice and peace of mercy and forgiveness and impartiality, and they forgot it. And they ended up presenting God at times as violent and sectarian and, and angry on their side and not on others' side. So the prophets came to remind them again and again about who God actually was and what their responsibilities were to love God and worship God alone, to reveal God to the world. That's their purpose. And love their neighbor as themselves. That's how you do it. And they got it again, and then they lost it again, and forgot it, and so on. That's how the unfolding of salvation history has gone. It might have looked at times like they were just going in circles and not getting anywhere, but from a broader perspective, from God's eye view, they were in fact undergoing God and growing towards salvation. And then there came a time at a particular point in this history that a most amazing thing took place. And it wasn't the rising of a mighty empire or military that would, took over the world, nor was it this cataclysmic act of, of nature that, that 
you know, restarted life on earth. But it was a single baby who was born, a little Jewish kid named Jesus. And he came in the footsteps of so many Hebrew prophets before him as the voice and the presence and the promise, as Judy spoke it with the kids, the promise of God, bringing help to us who needed some help from saving ourselves. He came bringing good news to the poor, proclaiming release for the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and letting the oppressed go free. That was his mission statement. And we say this coming was the pivotal point in the history of the world. The point by which all history from then on out would be defined, which is why, in fact, we date our calendars based upon his birth. Jesus came as the definitive, cumulative expression of God's presence in the world, and in him was the culmination of all salvation history. The human being finally arrived and fully divine. Woohoo! Right? And we'd love to say we all lived happily ever after. But as we all know, we as humans have not fully stepped into our inheritance that Jesus promised us as sons and daughters, as people, as children of God. In fact, we really couldn't handle the revelation of God in human form much at all. So instead of, you know, ourselves into ash at the glory of it all, we took him and we killed him. We killed him in hopes of saving ourselves because we had no idea what we were doing. And as a result, the painfully long process of our becoming continues. Or was it God's plan all along? No. 2,000 years later, salvation history unfolds in us and around us. In our denomination, the United Church of Christ, we, we've named this reality by saying God is still speaking. We believe that God is still speaking to us and we're still trying to get it. It's so, it seems like so long ago, but maybe 2,000 years in the course of human history, I mean, it's not all that long. So Jesus Christ's impact upon us and our world is still unfolding. It's a good thing to remember for each of us individually when we think we've done a lot of personal work and growth and we find ourselves right back into same old deadening patterns that we thought we had dealt with, which I think we, many of us have experienced in our lives. Or when we are in a particularly dark time in our lives, a dark night of the soul or wandering in the wilderness, it's so important to remember that we are a work in progress and we mustn't despair at finding our way. We mustn't stop believing that we will reach the promised land or rise from the tomb of our troubled relationships, that we can be healed of our various addictions and released into the light of a new day of freedom in God's time with our commitment and labor but in God's time. And the same is true for the life of the world. We as the church must tell salvation history and remind ourselves and the world along with us that God's salvation is occurring as bleak as the individual snapshots of this or that situation might seem. We are still undergoing God. We are undergoing God. There is liberation and resurrection going on. We just have to recognize it point it out, celebrate it when we witness it. All movements towards justice and care for creation, towards the unity of humankind, care for the poor, release of the captives, liberation for the oppressed, that's the movement of God. 
in us and around us. And they were in seed form in God's initial revelation to the Jewish people 4,000 years ago. And such things were concentrated also in the fullness of Jesus Christ as you read his story in the Gospels. And now it is that reality expanding out, that reality is expanding outward towards all humanity in remarkable ways. The kingdom of God, the heavenly realm, the new Jerusalem, the Bible refers to it, is a place, a reality of freedom and love and justice and restoration and fulfillment. And we are painfully aware that we are not there yet, but we are constantly invited to take the next best step we know how. however small, to bring it about, to bring so that, so that God's love becomes a reality at the culmination of history. And then in the meantime, Ben Wilson and Ben Wilson's children and great-great-grandchildren will continue to speak the words of promise and hope in the church for what is to come. Amen.